So um, I will talk today about collecting and leveraging data without crowd workers. And throughout my research, I hold a strong hypothesis that um, I hold a strong hypothesis that existing architectures like transformers, unit, etc., can solve most of the tasks that we are interested in. And therefore, my main focus is data. Or in other words, data is king. Um, the go-to method for collecting data over the past few centuries has been to use crowd workers, like Mechanical Turk, for example. However, crowd workers are expensive for some tasks like image editing, for example, or question answering in medical domain, they are just not capable of doing. And also, if we want a lot of data, crowd workers are very hard to scale. So in this talk, we will first talk about how we can collect data without crowd workers. And we will also talk how we can utilize the collected data to solve the tasks that we are interested in. We will go over two methods to, uh, to do so. The first method is self-supervised training. Uh, we will cover two different scenarios that we utilize self-supervised training in. The first one is few shot extractive question answering in the field of NLP, in which by taking a regular text corpus from Wikipedia, for example, and converting it into pseudo questions, we were able to get much better performance uh, in few shot question answering uh, than uh, models that at the time were state of the art like Spenbert and Roberta. We will then move to text to image generation and specifically the task of subject driven generation. We will show how we can utilize self supervised training to not only generate high quality images that correspond to a textual description, but importantly, also correspond to a subject image. Afterwards, we will deviate from self-supervised training into the method of gamification, which basically means that we are making it fun for people, humans, users, to create labeled data for us. We will specifically show how we utilize this, me this method to collect human preferences in text to image generation. And we will talk about how this method of gamification enabled us to train a scoring function that predicts the preferences of humans um, of which image they prefer more given a textual description, which enabled us, and we, show, we will showcase how this scoring function is the best scoring function uh, for, um, for model evaluation in text to image and how we can also utilize it to um, improve text to image generation itself by ranking. Um, overall, we'll cover three papers uh, that I've carried out throughout my PhD. Um, cool, so are there any questions uh, before we dive into the details? Okay, excellent. And as I've previously said, really, any question, just should go ahead and ask. It will make the talk much more uh, uh, interesting and interactive. Cool. So the first paper, Few Shot Question Answering by Training Spend Selection with Ori Ram, Jonathan Berant, Amir Globerson, and Omar Levy. In this paper, our goal was to collect and utilize data for few shot extractive question answering. But before, I, uh, but before I go ahead to how we did it, I want to say a few words about what extractive question answering even is and why we want to solve it in few shot settings. So in extractive question answering, the model gets as input a paragraph from Wikipedia, a, a, paragra a paragraph of text, sorry. For example, this paragraph of text from Wikipedia about Super Bowl 50. And the model also receives a question about the paragraph and is required to extract the answer from the paragraph. Obviously, uh, a lot of the stuff we, uh, that 
are done in Google search are very relevant to this kind of task. So this task is of great interest. And we want to solve it in few shot settings, which means that we want to solve it with a very small amount of labeled examples because collecting a lot of data for question answering in new domains like medical and new languages like Hebrew is practically is impractical to do with crowd workers. Um, is impractical to do with a lot of data. So uh, we want to do it uh, in a few shot settings. And finally, at the time, the best models for the task were um, MLMs like Robert and Spenbert, which were bad at, uh, at few shot extractive question answering. Here you can see, see their performance across different uh, number of labeled examples when compared uh, to, uh, to their performance uh, when they're given like tens of thousands of examples. So there was a lot of room for improvement. Okay, cool. So now that we understand what extractive question answering is and why we want to solve it in few shot settings, we can discuss the self-supervised training scheme um, that we applied. And I think that it's like, I know that uh, your group are mostly interested in, uh, in image generation, but I think that there is a lot of analogies that can be applied between what we did here and stuff that can be done in, uh, in other domains, as I'll uh, uh, show uh, afterwards, uh, specifically in text to image. So we can get a lot of uh, documents of text. For example, this document of text from Wikipedia about Super Bowl 50, uh, we can get as many of them as we want. Um, naturally, such documents of text will have some spans of text that occur more than once. So for example, you can see that Denver Broncos appears more than once in this document of text. What we do is we replace all of the occurrences of a recurring span, except from one. So here, for example, we replaced Denver Broncos and we'll replace it with a question token. Now, the task becomes to predict from the question token to extract the answer. Uh, so this is what we are doing during pre-training. We're taking this test, text corpus, converting it into a lot of pseudo questions, and then we are predicting from the pseudo questions the answer. And during test time and few shot fine tuning, given this paragraph of text and a question about this paragraph, we will simply append the question token after the question and we will use it to extract the answer from it. Um, so the important uh, the important thing that I want to focus on is that pre-training time and test time and future fine tuning time are very, very, very similar to one another. And this is the core key to have a successful performance in few shot uh, test time uh, in few shot fine tuning or even uh, zero shot. And as we can see, um, we were able to get very large performance gains over models like Spenbert and Roberta, which at the time were state of the art with our model Splinter. And we can see it not only for a lot of different uh, data scenarios where we have different um, number of labeled examples, but we can also see it across lots of different question answering data sets. Um, in all of them, we show very large performance gains. And I think that an interesting anecdote is that a follow-up paper by, by Castel et al. Uh, trained a generative uh, model T5 using our pre-training scheme and showed that using our exact data, they're able to get very, very uh, good uh, uh, performance in zero shot settings. So this is another important aspect that putting, uh, putting creating very high quality Creating good data for pre-training is an orthogonal access to making model improvements. So the data will still be there. And when new models come up, they will still be able to leverage this data. Uh, great. Are there any questions about the previous paper before I move on to the next one?
Cool. Okay. So the next paper, X and Fuse, Fusing Visual Information in Text-to-Image Generation with Omer Levy and Adam Poliak. Uh, in subject-driven generation, the user has two things in mind. A textual prompt, for example, a toy truck, and some image of a subject. For example, this image of a truck. And the user wants to generate an image that will align with both the toy truck and the subject image. And as you can see here, the generated image really is of a toy truck, but it's not only toy truck, it's of this specific toy truck of the subject image. So this is the task of subject-driven generation. And obviously, collecting data for subject-driven generation is very hard. Just imagine, we'll need to ask uh, uh, workers on, on Mechanical Turk, please take a specific item and take an image of it, think of a prompt, write it down, then put this item, <laughs> make, yeah. So we can understand that it's very hard to collect such data. And therefore, we resorted to self-supervised training. Um, so what is our self-supervised training uh, scheme? What we do is we have a, corp a, a text image uh, data set, like Lion, for example, which has caption and image pairs. We take the input image, we extract some kind of subject out of it, and then we augment the subject. Uh, afterwards, we provide to the model, a diffusion model, for example, with both the original caption and the augmented subject image, and we make it predict the original image, which is now the target image, okay? So importantly, do pay attention to the fact that this gives the model exactly the bias that we want it to have. Very easily and simply, we give it bias to generate an image that is both faithful to the subject image and faithful to the uh, caption, which is what we want during inference time. Now, an interesting question is how we can condition on the subject image. And importantly, how we can condition on it using a unit, because obviously with a transformer, it's very straightforward. Everything with transformers is very easy, but with the unit, we are there are more options that are less trivial. So just as a short reminder, basically a unit is comprised out of many blocks. Each such block is made out of two main components, a residual block and an attention block. Uh, it receives two inputs, a caption representation and a noise image representation. The noise image representation goes through the residual block, uh, th through the res block, and then it does self-attention with itself in the attention block, and then cross-attention with the caption representation, and this goes on and on for many blocks. So how we can condition on a subject image with this architecture? The first option that we might be tempted to do is to concatenate the subject image representation alongside the channel dimension of the noise image representation, right? This is pretty like similar to, this is I think the go-to method for many people that are uh, have experience with the uh, uh, image generation. However, this option is suboptimal because it assumes spatial correspondence between the conditioned image, the subject image, and the noise image. However, this is simply not the case because, as you can see, even in our uh, even in our toy example, uh, there is no spatial correspondence between the subject image and the between the subject image and the conditioned image. So this is just not an assumption that we can make. The second option that we have is to get some kind of bottleneck representation of the subject image representation using a model like clip, for example, and then feed it in the attention block and do attention with it. However, this option is also suboptimal 
because there is a lot of inf- there may be information loss uh, with this bottleneck representation for example it may not preserve identity um, which is essential in subject driven generation we want this specific truck or person or whatever to uh, to be in the output we don't want to lose the identity and the third thing that we want is to be able to easily adapt uh, to the new data so this means to add a few parameters as possible okay so what we've done is is very simple and very effective. Using shared weights between the res block, we feed the sub- subject-driven generation into the same res block that we feed the noise image representation. Okay? Afterwards, we concatenate the subject-driven re- representation to the noise image representation. Then, we do full attention between the noise image representation And the subject image representation and then similarly to what we did before we do cross attention between uh, the caption representation and afterwards we uh, retrieve those elements to how they were before so they can naturally go into the at- next attention block this method allows us to have robustness to spatial differences because we do full attention between the subject image representation and And the noise image representation there is no information loss because we are able to provide all of the pixels the raw pixels of the subject driven representation and allow the unit to learn how to process them and finally note we didn't add any new parameter so fine-tuning using this method is very very quick uh, at the time uh, the main baseline was textual inversion and And as we can see both uh, quantitatively, uh, the quality uh, text alignment and subject alignment of our method, which we call X and fuse, um, works much better. Oh, and something that I forgot to say, I'm talking now only about subject driven generation, but we actually showed that this method is very, very general, and we were able to get state of the art FID score by using retrieval augmented generation. Using this mechanism, and also we showed that we can effectively do scene based generation using this mechanism. So uh, if you're interesting, you can go afterwards and read the paper. There are lots of uh, additional details. Uh, yeah. And as we can see qualitatively, our model is able to preserve the identity of the subject image and to uh, place the subject image in different uh, places and to copy the style, unique styles of the subject image. For example, here you can see the very specific style of this cat and we can print it, uh, we can render it as a dog or as an owl. And, um, and it can do very, very cool edits, I think, like take this teddy bear and generate it as a beautiful dog that is by the river. Uh, yeah, so... And just to point out, this method is also extremely, extremely fast, especially when compared to optimization-based techniques like textual inversion or uh, dream booth. It's much, much faster because like one second, because we don't do any optimization. Also note that it requires only a single image because uh, it requires only a single image because, and therefore it's much more relevant for productization. And last, Because we're able to pre-train on their on all of the web data that we have, there is no overfitting, and we don't need to worry about uh, prior preservation and stuff like that. Cool. Are there any questions about uh, X and fuse? Okay, great. So next, I'll talk about the final paper that we'll talk about today. Pick a pick. An open data set of user preferences for text to image generation with Adam Poliak, Uriel Zinger, Shabulan Matiana, Joe Pena, and Omer Levy. Um, the goal in this uh, paper was to collect a lot of data 
for human preferences in text to image. And the context is that human preferences made an incredible impact in the field of NLP. For example, ChatGPT, InstructGPT, you name it. However, there was no open and large data set of human preferences in text to image. And to solve this issue, we wanted to go in a different path than self-supervised training. And we wanted to go with supervised training. But remember, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that crowd workers are, are not appealing because they are, uh, because they are expensive, like the, their interest is, is misaligned with like our interest sometimes and et cetera. So what we did is we chose the method of gamification uh, and to make it fun for real users to create label data for us. Specifically, we created a web application that is called pickapick.io that allows users to generate images from text for free. And the, like, the caveat is that the user has to specify their preferences after each time uh, they get an image. And like most users had fun doing so. Uh, so that way we collect uh, preferences from users. This allowed us to collect more than half a million examples of human preferences in which each example has a prompt that the user invented two images, and importantly, a label for which image the user preferred. And let's take a second and look at the data, okay? This data is very, very, very different from what you'll see in MS Coco, which is like the evaluation data set, the standard benchmark for evaluating text to image models. You will never see a uh, prompts like Jedi Duck holding a lightsaber on MS Coco or a butterfly flying above an ocean or a bird with eight spider legs. And this is the data that users want to see. We utilize the data that we've collected to train a scoring function, a clip-based scoring function that is called peak score. This scoring function, like, uh, like clip, gets as input an image, a prompt, but unlike clip, the score that it outputs is supposed to estimate the level of satisfaction of a user from the image giving the prompt. So it's not only text alignment, it's whatever the user decides that they are interested in. The objective that we use to train a, a peak score is analogous to that of Instruct GPT. Specifically, during training, we have two images, Y1 and Y2, and the prompt X. We will denote our scoring function, which is clip-based with S, and we have a preference distribution vector that signals which image, which signals the preference of the user. So for example, if the user preferred Y1, the preference distribution vector will be one zero. And we want now to minimize the differences between the preference distribution vector and our prediction of it, which will denote with p hat. To calculate this p hat, we'll take softmax uh, between uh, the scores that the model outputs, and we'll use KL divergence between the real preference distribution vector and our prediction of it to minimize the distance between them. When measuring the performance of peak score in predicting human preferences, we can see that peak score is not only better than existing, existing scoring functions like aesthetics predictor or clip, and not only better than concurrent work like image reward and HPS, it is even better than human experts in the task of predicting human preferences. And now I have a question 
for uh, for you. How can the performance of peak score be superhuman that is better than human experts if we used humans to create the data set in the first place? So the answer to this question is that the user that created this data, that annotated this data, has much more information than the human expert that we employed as annotators. For example, the user knows their own artistic flavor and they know which details the prompt might miss, etc. But the annotator are, is oblivious to all of those details. And this is also an important thing to note. Real users have a much better signal than crowd workers. Therefore, if we would simply take the prompt that the user created with two generated images and allow human, human annotators to choose which image is preferable, we will get a non-accurate enough data when compared to the data that we could, that we are getting when we're employing real users. So when you are able to get real user data, always prefer it over data from annotators. Um, yeah, so cool. So when evaluating peak score's ability to evaluate text to image model performance, we find that it is not only much more correlated with, uh, with human preferences than FID, but it is also much better correlated uh, with real user preferences than, scoring than other scoring functions. This means that if we want to evaluate um, the performance of text to image models, we shouldn't use, or we shouldn't use only FID as an automatic metric. So now that we are equipped with prompts that real users created that are much more relevant than MS Coco captions, and a scoring function like peak score that is much better correlated with human preferences than FID, um, we suggest to completely update the standard protocol for evaluating text to image uh, generation, and specifically to use prompts from peak score rather than MS Coco captions, and to use uh, to use prompts from peak a peak rather than MS Coco captions, and to use peak score rather than FID. Um, afterwards, we experiment with improving text to image generation by ranking. Specifically, um, specifically, what we do is we generate a lot of like we generate several images um, for each prompt, and then we use different scoring functions to choose one image out of this set of generated images. We can see that peak score is able to outperform um, both the vanilla text to image and aesthetics predictor and clip um, in, choosing the, in choosing the best image. And we can also um, see it uh, qualitatively in the images here. You can see on the left, the vanilla text to image model and on the right uh, images that the uh, peak score chose. Um, cool. Are there any questions about peak a peak before I move on? Okay, cool. So to summarize, existing architectures are sufficient to solve many tasks. And as we've demonstrated across different domains, focusing of the, on the data can be essential to solve different tasks. 
And because collecting such data with crowd workers has many downsides, one way to replace uh, crowd workers is to use self-supervised training. Looking forward, many, many tasks can utilize self-supervised training. And there are lots of more opportunities to utilize self-supervised training with. But a better way, when it's applicable, is to gamify the data collection procedure um, because nothing beats data, uh, real user data, and uh, user preferences and user data can really unlock new possibilities and even lead to the creation of new tasks that we didn't have in mind. Um, cool. So thank you very much for listening. Um, really, uh, obviously, the paper that I presented here are were in collaboration with really amazing co-authors that I've learned a lot from. Um, yeah, so I'd love to take questions now or... Uh, yeah.